This week on Maker Update, a parachuting robot, a less is more approach to 3D printing, sliding tables, pixel cufflings, impossible overhangs, and nine ways to over-engineer a drill press. Hello and welcome back to Maker Update. I'm Tyler Weingartner and I hope you're all doing great. We've got a little bit of a theme with this show around shop upgrades. So if you're looking for some inspiration, there's a ton of great stuff coming up. But first, we've got an awesome project of the week. So let's check it out. I haven't ever been a part of a high altitude balloon launch, but it seems like the most annoying part of them is recovering your payload. Sure, technologies like GPS make it a lot easier, since at least you know where it is, but you still have to go and get it. There's no guarantee that it landed anywhere that's easy to retrieve. Which is why Johan Haji developed R2 Home, an auto-return parachute system for high-altitude balloon launches and suborbital rockets. Once the parachute is deployed, it uses GPS to determine its location in relation to the launch site, and then uses the control surfaces that are part of the parachute to return home. The system uses a two-part parachute. The first part is a drogue chute, which deploys early on in freefall. Once it reaches terminal velocity, it exerts enough force to deploy the paraglider canopy, which is what helps guide the payload back to the launch site. To steer the chute, it uses a single continuous rotation servo to pull on the control surfaces of the canopy to guide it back home. When the main canopy is deployed, the drogue chute also collapses, so it doesn't interfere with the flight. The onboard computer is a Teensy 4.1 in a custom PCB. The system also has an upward-facing camera to monitor the parachute, a GPS receiver for geolocation, and a telemetry radio so the launch team can keep up with it in flight. This looks really promising, and it's a great solution to the problem. You can read more about the project on the MakeScene blog or on Johan's project page on Hackaday. We've got some more projects for you. David Picciuto is adding a sliding crosscut table to his table saw. These are common on industrial table saws, but you don't usually see them in typical workshop saws. These are superior to miter gauges and crosscut sleds because they allow you to make larger crosscuts both easier and safer, while also giving you access to the entire table saw blade instead of losing three quarters of an inch to a crosscut sled. The whole thing lives on a frame made of plywood and angle iron, while the sliding table slides on a pair of linear rails. He's added a few stops to restrict the movement, as well as a simple but effective locking pin to keep the table in place when he doesn't want it to move. He then builds a fence for the table in a way that he can remove it easily, but can replace it without needing to calibrate it. His solution involves a locking stop and a mag switch to restrict the movement. You get to see the whole development process in the video, as well as the parts list, if you want to replicate the build. Wesley Treat is building an elevator to get better access to the loft space in his workshop. This is hardly the first loft elevator that's come to YouTube, but Wesley has a few unique problems he wants to solve with this one. First, he wants to be able to access both sides of the lift, so he's riding the hoist cable through the frame, so it works a little bit like a block and tackle. I'm no physicist, but this should reduce the load on the hoist motor as well. When it was done, he made sure to finish off the project with a little bit of theatrics. When the lift is in motion, there's flashing lights and warning beeps and the whole nine. And over on Adafruit, I saw these animated NeoPixel cufflinks by Aaron St. Blade. As you would expect, they're a little oversized as cufflinks, but they're a real testament to how tiny and powerful the current state of microcontrollers are. Each of these is controlled by a Cutie Pie RP2040 connected to a 5x5 NeoPixel Grid BFF board. One of the really clever bits is how she's using a pair of stiff, solid core wires to not only connect the battery, but also act as the cuffling to attach them to your shirt cuffs. She finishes off the look with a metal jewelry bezel and some UV resin to diffuse the light. Now for some tips and tools, Mary's Hornberger is going a little crazy with upgrades to his vintage drill press. He's adding a motor to lift and lower the table, a pneumatic system to lock the table into position, a digital depth gauge, and an air assist blower that activates when he's actually drilling. There's even a cutting oil misting system that he can toggle off and on. 
You might not need all of these to achieve your ideal tool, but I'm sure that one or two of these might be appropriate for your own shop. Over on their channel, Needed Make It has a great tip for adding more strength to 3D printed parts. Surprisingly enough, the trick doesn't involve building out your part, but by cutting it away. When designing your part, you can create these tiny little voids within solid parts of your print. When you go to slice your model, the slicer will deal with these by adding perimeter walls around the voids. Perimeter walls tend to be stronger than infill. Plus, you can place these voids in different directions to make it stronger against different kinds of forces. Speaking of cool tricks, through a CNC kitchen I learned about this unique slicing technique for creating nearly perfect overhangs without the need for support material. These are called arc overhangs. When you see the way they're printed, the name seems awfully appropriate. The slicer builds out a pattern of concentric arcs to fill out the shape of the overhang. It begins with larger arcs and then uses smaller ones to fill in the corners. But because each consecutive layer is supported by the last one, they're able to create some pretty dramatic overhangs without the need for support. This is currently available just as a proof of concept, but you can download some test prints to try them out yourself. At one point or another, you've probably read some headlines about 3D printed homes made of extruded concrete. This is certainly one way to scale up additive manufacturing, but from Belinda Carr, I learned about these bricklaying robots that seem to do a better job of building structures with a simpler setup and less waste. The surprising thing is that there's no mortar between the bricks, just construction adhesive. These use specialized bricks that are very dimensionally accurate, so there's no need for mortar to fill the gaps. It'll be interesting to see how these two technologies evolve in the future of construction. For this week's DigiKey Spotlight, we've got a first look at Panduit cable entry systems. If you have a project that involves a ton of custom wiring into a control box, these look like a great way to keep dust and other contaminants out, while keeping your cable routing tidy and secure. They're fairly modular, so you can adapt them to your project with a broad range of cable diameters. Plus, you can use these to install cables that have already been terminated, so it makes them easier to work with. All right, and that is going to do it for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe picked up a couple of shop infrastructure tips. If you did, give us a thumbs up, leave us a comment, and hit subscribe so you won't miss the next one. As always, huge thanks to DigiKey for making the show possible and to you for watching. Take care. We'll see you soon.